Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. Um, today we will continue talking about electronic oscillators and we will expand whatever we had on the uh, 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 previous lecture. Um, uh, the previous lecture was slightly simplified, very slightly, so we will just add another component into our electronic oscillator, the resistor, which obviously exists everywhere because every electronic circuit has some resistance um, and it will slightly change our uh, calculations uh, but this will be a very practical kind of RLC um, circuit R stands for um, resistor, uh, L stands for inductor and C stands for uh, capacitor so um, now this lecture is a continuation of the course Physics 14 presented on unizor.com I suggest you to watch this lecture from the website um, the website contains the course, which means there is a menu, there is a sequence, there is a logical connection between the lectures, there is a prerequisite course called Mass Proteins, which is definitely contains a, a, a necessary information for studying physics. Um, and everything, the whole website is completely free, there are no advertisements, no strings attached, etc. So, um, okay, so we will start with the same um, electronic circuit as in the previous lecture which contains inductor and uh, a capacitor and just add one more element, the resistor okay, so let me just remind you so first we had inductor uh, we had a capacitor and now we will add a resistor Now, if you recall, we had a battery to charge the um, capacitor and a switch, a B switch. So in this position, this thing is not connected to anything and uh, the battery is charging the capacitor. Then we flip the switch to A position Now the battery is no longer involved, now we have a circuit and magic begins. Now, what's the magic? Okay, let me just remind you. We had certain amount of charge accumulated on the capacitor from the batteries. So let's say this is plus and this is minus, okay? What happens in this case? Well, electrons will start moving from uh, axis of electrons plate, which is minus, to the positive uh, plate through resistor through inductor the problem is gradually we are discharging basically our capacitor so the amount of charge is diminishing because the electrons are moving from here to here so that means that our electric current in this circuit is changing it's variable it's diminishing it. In so far it's diminishing, right? Now the problem is that this is an inductor and we know that um, uh, the electric current which goes through a wire um, uh, has magnetic field around it. Now the uh, uh, Faraday's uh, uh, self-induction uh, principle says that whenever the magnetic field is changing it actually produces the electromotive force so in this particular case the magnetic field is changing because the current is changing but since it's changing it produces electromotive force and it supports the current so the current not only goes all the way to discharge completely but since it's supported it continues actually going and as it continues, because of electromotive force um, produced by, by the inductor, this minus becomes eventually plus. Electrons are moving uh, in axis to this part, and this becomes minus. What happens next? Well, the next thing is just completely reverse situation. Electrons from here, whenever the charge will be like too much and the force of the 
uh, inductor will no longer electromotive force which is produced by inductor is no longer supporting this current the current dies but when it dies it's already charged with a minus and plus and an opposite charge and then the whole thing the whole cycle starts back now without this resistor if there is absolutely no resistance that was the last lecture and these oscillation would be infinite so it would be a sinusoidal um, current current is I of T current is the same everywhere obviously it's a, su it, it's a closed circuit so the I of T was um, in this particular case a sinusoidally changing now what happens if there is a resistor or, well, more precisely, the whole circuit has some resistance somewhere. But right now I just concentrate it in this particular case. I mean, this particular uh, object uh, in the circuit, con considering that the, the rest doesn't have any resistance. It doesn't really matter. So what happens then? And that's the subject of this lecture. So let's assume that inductor, uh, inductance of the inductor is L. The capacity capacitance of the capacitor is C and resistance of the resistor is R. Now, we will do exactly the same as in the previous lecture, which means I will um, uh, talk about voltage on each of these things. Uh, so this voltage on this would be VL of T, voltage on this will be VR of T, and voltage on capacitor would be Vc of T. All of them are changing, obviously, all the time. But what's important is there is no source of electricity here, which means that the sum of the voltage drops on each of these things should be equal to zero. Otherwise, we would have some kind of an infinite source of uh, uh, energy, right? So this is equal to zero. Okay, fine. What I'm doing now is um, basically repeating the same thing which was uh, in a previous lecture, and then I will add something related to resistor. Now, first of all, let's talk about uh, capacitor. Now, what is C? What is capacitance? What is C? Well, basically, it, it's a connection between amount of charge which is accumulated on the uh, capacitor and the voltage between the plates. So it's a Q of T and VC of T. They are related. Now, how are they related? Well, they are related this way. Constant. And that's what capacitance is. So whenever you have any kind of a capacitor, the more charge you put in, the more voltage you have between the plates, and they are proportional, always. And that's the capacitance, it's a constant. Well, from which I will do two things. Now, the thing number two, I will put that Vc of t is equal to 1 over c times q of t. And then, you see, I'm going to use current. However, the current is very much related to the charge. So, what is the current? Well, if this is the charge between the plates, <coughs> and it's discharging, basically, electrons going from, uh, from negative to positive, well, uh, the uh, electric current, by definition, is a rate of change of the charge. Well, rate of electron flow, if you wish. All right? Now, uh, what, what is this mathematically speaking? Well, mathematically speaking is A of t is just a derivative of the function uh, q. So if q is changing, if charge is changing, its derivative is a rate of change, and the rate of change is called electric current. So what I will do here, I will differentiate this to get rid of the q and be uh, and dealing with uh, so Vc first derivative is equal to 1 over C i of t great done
next. Next we have a uh, um, an inductor. All right. Now, what about this inductor? Um, we know that electromotive force, which we call uh, VL, which is developed by um, changing um, the uh, electric current, is related to this change. And let, let's talk about how. Electric current is producing um, magnetic field. Magnetic field has such a concept called flux. Okay. Now, what is flux? Magnetic flux is actually proportional to uh, the current. So, if you have, let's say, a wire loop, and you have a current, <coughs> then um, around this current, the um, uh, magnetic field is proportional to magnetic flux is proportional to um, uh, induct inductance of this of this uh, inductor. <coughs> That's a characteristic of of the um, of this inductor. So the magnetic field which goes through this sink um, through this uh, inductor is magnetic flux which which goes through this inductor is proportional to electric current now the electromotive force is related to um, uh, change of uh, magnetic flux so the um, electromotive force is actually a rate of change of magnetic flux on this inductor. Now, all this was started in details uh, in electromagnetism part of this course. So, if you do not remember this and you would like actually to refresh it, go to electromagnetism part of the course. There is a Faraday's law which basically explains all, all, the, all these things. I'm just using whatever the material was presented in electromagnetism part of this course. So electromotive force which is produced is proportional, is actually equal to a uh, rate of change of the magnetic flux, which in turn magnetic flux is dependent on the uh, current. So in this particular case what we can say is this is equal to L times I derivative L is a constant. L is inductance of the inductor. So that's how we have derived the value for VL. This is the um, electromotive force which is developed by the um, inductor. Finally, we are drop of the voltage on the resistor. Well, this is the Ohm's law, as we know, right? It's R times I T, where R is resistance. So, we have VR, drop on the resistor, we have VL, uh, drop on, well, not, it's not drop in this case, it's actually electromotive force, uh, which is produced by inductor, and we have um, derivative of the voltage on the capacitor. And now I would like them to somehow come up with this particular equation. Well, unfortunately I have the derivative here. And if I will put integral it would look ugly, quite frankly. So instead what I will do, I will do this. I will differentiate this and I will put second derivative, I will differentiate this, I will put first derivative, and then I can differentiate this too, because if some of them is equal to zero, some of their derivatives is, op is also equal to zero, and that's my equation. And let's do this right now. So what's my equation? 
L times second derivative of T plus R first derivative of T plus 1 over C function without derivative is equal to 0. That's my differential equation which basically delivers how current is changing. So any solution to this equation gives me basically behavior. Uh, okay, now if you will take a look at this equation and if you recall the mechanical um, oscillations um, in viscose environment, it looks exactly the same. So let me just remind you. So m times x of t plus c x c plus k x of t equals to zero. Okay, so this is an equation which was derived um, when we were studying um, um, uh, mechanical oscillations uh, in the viscose um, environment, damping. So, uh, let's say you have your uh, object on the spring in water. Water is basically damping the oscillations. It was exactly the same equation, just different coefficients, different letters, basically. So, from now on, everything, I mean, I can just stop here and just give you a final formula, um, but, but I will just do some explanation, obviously, but it's exactly the same, the same logic. Okay, so um, now this is, M is mass, C is um, um, viscosity coefficient, and this is the spring's elasticity, all right? and x is displacement from the neutral position. So, exactly the same equation, absolutely. Okay, so let's forget about this. And again, there are maybe more details when I was explaining solution to this than whatever I will do right now. But uh, since every lecture um, on the unizor.com uh, has detailed explanation, so you can go to basically notes for this lecture, which are quite detailed. All right, so how can we solve this equation? Okay, first of all, this is a very interesting equation. It's homogeneous, homogeneous, which means if function i of t is a solution, function i of t times constant, any constant, would be a solution as well. Why? Because the constant is going out from the derivative, so if instead of i, I will put k times i of t, well, the k will be here, the k will be here, and the k will be here, the k will cancel out, it will be exactly the same solution, right? So, obviously, uh, it's a homogeneous. It's also linear. Now, what linear means? Well, if you have two solutions, i1 and i2, then... any linear combination of those is also a solution. And again, it's obvious because uh, derivative of sum would be sum of derivative, derivative of multiplied by a constant would be etc. Et so, and uh, it's uh, second order because it's a second derivative. So, the linear and homogeneous is very uh, simple thing to solve. Um, if you would like to find some solution, there is obvious um, uh, uh, function which would satisfy very easily. We, we can find this function. The thing is that for these um, homogeneous linear uh, um, equations, differential equations of the second order, it is sufficient to find just two uh, partial solutions, two concrete solutions. I just find two functions which correspond. And then their linear combination with any coefficients describes all the general solutions. Okay, 
this is a fact. You can just take it as is because there are some, again, explanations to this in the course uh, mass for teens when I was talking about differential equations. But um, anyway, just take it for granted that uh, it, it, it's a theorem actually, which can be proven. So what my problem right now is just to find two solutions, two particular partial, I would say, solutions to this equation. And basically, the combination of these two solutions with any coefficients would be a solution. Okay. Um, so the obvious way to find the solution, and again, it's not I just came up with this. I'm not that smart. Uh, very smart people actually were doing this before me many times and they have suggested to look for a solution among function which looks like this where gamma is some coefficient why? because the first derivative of this would be this the second derivative of this would be this and if I will substitute it to this, you see that e to the gamma t can be just cancelled out because it never equals to zero, right? So it will be L times uh, gamma square times e to the gamma t, but it will cancel out plus R gamma plus uh, 1 over C. equals to zero. It's a quadratic e uh, equation and I can obviously find uh, two roots for this quadratic equation and two roots give me two um, independent uh, partial solutions. One will be e to the gamma first t, another will be e to the gamma second t and their combination would be a solution, general solution. Okay. So, what are gamma? Gamma 1, 2 is equal to um, uh, minus r divided by 2l plus minus square root um, r square r divided by 2l square minus 1 over LC, right? So, I've got two gammas. <sighs> no prob now, the problem is, I don't know if this is positive or negative or zero, because there are definitely uh, the problems here. First of all, if it's zero, I will not have two gammas. I will have only one gamma. And that represents only one partial solution. And we need two to have their linear combination as a general solution. Now, if it's positive, I can basically do whatever is necessary. Uh, and if it's negative, that would be uh, an imaginary number. And I have to really think about how to deal with imaginary number. Now, again, all these aspects were presented when I was talking about mechanical oscillations with damping. There are three different cases of damping, and it depends on the same thing, basically using different letters in mechanical oscillation. But we had the overdamping, underdamping, and critical um, uh, damping, cri cr critical level of damping uh, when it's equal to zero. So I will do exactly the same here, and I will try to be very brief. Well, first of all, uh, let me just make. Uh, okay, what is uh, if r to o l square minus 1 over l c is greater than 0 and I will therefore call it omega square. So my gamma 1, 2 is equal to minus r to l plus minus omega, right? So for the positive uh, uh, expression under the root, under square root, 
I can put it is equal to omega square since it's positive and the square root would be omega. And my two solutions are i is equal to a some coefficient e to the power minus r r to l plus omega t plus b e to the power minus r to l minus omega t. Now, what's interesting is that this is r over 2l. This is r over 2l squared minus something. Now, this something is positive. This is positive. This is positive. But this thing is smaller now than r over 2l squared, which means omega is smaller than r over 2l. Right? So this is omega, square root of this. Now, since we are diminishing the r over 2l squared, we have less. Still positive, but less. So the square root of this would be by absolute value less than r over 2l, which means that both of those guys would be negative. This is minus r over 2l, and there we are trying to plus something which is by absolute value smaller. So the gamma is negative. So this thing and this thing both are negative. So what we have here, we have e to the some negative number, and as the t is increasing, the graph of this thing would be this, and graph of this thing would be also kind of this. It's all diminishing, and their sum will be diminishing as well. Maybe a little wavy in the beginning, but again, it will be asymptotically um, uh, going to, uh, to, to zero, and after a certain amount of time, it will be only positive or only negative. It will not be both, because this is positive and this is positive. So no matter what our coefficients are, eventually all these coefficients would be brought down, well, not, not to zero, but it will be basically staying on the same side, plus or minus, so there will be no oscillations back and forth. The um, current will not go back and forth. It will go this way, maybe a little bit back, depending on these coefficients, but in, in a couple of uh, oscillations it will stay on the same positive or negative side, so it will be either this way or that way, depending on certain initial conditions, but there will be no oscillations. Second. Second is when this is equal to zero. Okay, well let's think about what happens in this case. Okay, if omega is equal to zero, this is omega. Okay, um, the problem is we have only one root, we have only one solution, we have only one gamma. Where is the second one? We need two to make a general solution. Well, we have to look somehow differently. Okay, the first we were trying to find among these type of functions. Well, for this thing, we can find another, we can try t times e to the gamma t. Is there a solution to this? Well, if I will substitute this into the equation, I put first derivative, second derivative, put the equation, I will also get a solution. It will be a very easy kind of uh, calculations, and I will get exactly a solution, gamma 2. And it will be equal to exactly the same thing. But now, instead of two functions of this kind, I will have one function of this kind and one function of this kind with the same um, uh, uh, gamma, which means my, my general solution would be a, a to the minus 2 uh, minus r divided by 2lt plus b times t because this is a different function by e to the same t 
or you can just put e to the minus r over 2lt out of the brackets and here you have something like this. So, so this is a different function. It's a general, again, general solution in case of critical damping, critical when this is equal to zero. But this is also not a permanent oscillations around uh, some kind of uh, neutral, neutral slide. Because this is a linear function and this is exponential with a, gr uh, with a negative uh, exponent. So the graph would be, again, it might actually be something like this, but then it will stay on the same, on the same side. After initial fluctuations, it will be gradually diminishing because this is very strong. As t goes, uh, as t increasing, the time is increasing. This is a major factor, and whatever it is, it will just go straight down without changing the sign, without anything. And the third, I would say, more interesting case. when this is negative. I will call it minus omega square. So, <coughs> the result would be gamma 1, 2 is equal to minus R to L plus minus omega I where i square is equal to minus 1. It's an um, imaginary unit. So now you have to know the complex numbers. And again, if you don't go back to mass proteins, there is a chapter for complex numbers, so you can learn it over there. But you see how many different mathematical pieces you have to really know to, to learn physics. <coughs> OK. Now, what does uh, it give me? Well, it gives me two solutions, but the problem is the function, when gamma is this, the function is um, uh, with complex values. And that's not exactly what I'm looking for. I'm looking for I is electric current. It's obviously the real value, uh, valued function, right? But here is an interesting um, uh, uh, case. You see, this is as I was saying before, linear, homogeneous, etc. Now, what if you have a complex function? Let's say i of t is equal to x of t plus i y of t. Complex function obviously can be represented in this way, right? Complex function with complex values. Well, if you substitute this to this, now, um, again, uh, derivative is a, a linear function, so derivative of sum would be sum of derivatives. So your real parts will be the real L times x, uh, the second derivative, plus R times first uh, derivative of x, and 1 over C, x itself. And then I times the same for, um, for y. And if I have a complex number, a plus b i is equal to zero. It means a is equal to zero and b is equal to zero. Which means x should be a solution and y should be a solution. Because x should be substitute if 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 if, uh, uh, if, if x uh, in, in this particular expression plus i uh, multiplied by y of this expression is equal to zero, then this expression for x should be equal to zero and this expression for y should be equal to zero. So my, 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 my point right now is that if I will be able to express this function with this um, uh, exponent as real part and separately um, imaginary part, I will have uh, two different solutions. Real part would be a solution, and this coefficient uh, at i would be another. So all I have to do is I have to represent function e to the gamma t for this gamma in real plus imaginary part. And this is very easy to do using Euler's formula. e to the i x is equal to 
cosine x plus i sine x. Euler's formula. Great formula. So, let's do it. power minus r over 2l plus omega i t. This is what? This is e to the power minus r 2l t multiplied by e to the power omega i. Well, actually it's plus minus, so I will put plus minus equals to e to the power minus r to lt times, and I will use this formula. So it will be cosine omega i um, plus sine i sine t. Omega t, sorry. Omega t plus sine omega t. Um, now, where is minus? Well, <coughs> in theory, plus or minus should be here. Right? Plus minus. But cosine is uh, an even function, to, so I can drop plus or minus. Sine is an odd function, so plus or minus can go out. So that's what I have. And, as I was saying, if I will take only the real part, it would be a solution which means which means e to the power r over 2 lt times cosine omega t is a solution and e to the power minus r over 2 l times sine omega t is another solution. And if I will do this, I will have complete solution. Plus or minus doesn't really matter because A and B are, as I was saying, for a general solution I, I just have two partial and any coefficients including plus or minus doesn't really matter. So these two partial solutions give me the general solution for this particular equation. Now, how this thing is looking. Well, now you have the oscillations. Because this is obviously something which goes down to zero, but this is the amplitude. But if this amplitude, now the cosine for instance is something like this, right? But if you will multiply it by this, it will just diminish the amplitude. So it will be this, and then this, and then this, and this. it will be lower and lower. <coughs> amplitude will be smaller. And same thing with this. So basically the total solution general, which I, I would rather say solution to this problem is e to the power minus r over 2lt a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. So that's the general solution to this particular equation. And now we have oscillations. And oscillations are in case r to l square minus 1 over lc 
less than zero. So R is not really very big. R is resistors, resistance. So the bigger the R, the greater this, and it, it will be greater than zero. That's it, basically. There will be no oscillations. But while resistance is not very big, um, everything will be fine. Now, if resistance is zero, you will have this, and this is omega is equal to omega squared is equal to 1 over LC. If you remember, this is from the previous lecture. So that's why it's omega. It's basically the angular uh, speed of oscillations. Well, basically, that's it. Now, just as a trigonometric, another part of mathematics, trigonometric exercise, I did it a few times. This can be converted into sine or, or cosine uh, with uh, phase shift, if you remember. So what I, what I can do with this equation, I can uh, multiply it and divide it by this, a over square root cosine omega t plus b divided by the same square root sine omega t. Now, this and this can be cosine of some kind of phi and sine of some kind of phi. And now this is a, rep a, a trigonometric formula, cosine, cosine plus sine, sine. That's actually a cosine of omega t minus phi. So it's a sh phase shift in this particular case. So instead of this, you can put this. And that would be some kind of d, this square root. So the whole thing depends also, now it depends on two parameters a and b. Now this thing depends on two parameters g and phi, where g is defined as this, and phi is defined like cosine of phi is this, and sine is that. So everything is defined. And this is just looks a little bit better. Now we really see that this is uh, 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 an oscillations with gradually diminishing because of this multiplier amplitude. Well, that's it for today. I do suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. They're much more detailed than whatever I was just talking about, um, with references to previous lectures, etc., etc. All right, good luck. Thank you.